All right, we're continuing the uh, interview series here on 30,000 Feet, and we're in the studio, a.k.a. MRY New Offices, with founder and CEO Matt Britton. So I wanted to continue our series and talking um, less about the industry of marketing and more about inspiring stories from entrepreneurs. So Matt Britton, you know, right out of college, started his own company. It hasn't worked for anyone, or have have you ever had an actual like employer? Have you always started your own companies from the from day one? Well, I have an employer now. Okay, now part <laughs> uh, of the public company through an yes. acquisition, which is the way you Google want to do it. Who was my employer? Right? Um, I had an employer um, in early two thousand when I sold my first company. Okay. So, but those were the only companies I worked for. Is the companies who I actually sold my businesses to. Okay, so right out of college. What was the thought process in saying, like, I just want to do my own thing. I don't want to have a boss. I'm going to start my own thing. Or did it just evolve like that? How did it all start? It sort of evolved like that. Like, I've never created a resume. I've never looked for a job. I kind of just always tried to figure out how I can, you know, go out there and hustle and try to create business opportunities for myself. And going and interviewing for a company was never one of those ways that I thought to achieve that. Right. There's always... Who do I know? At what opportunities are in front of me? Whether it was promoting nightclubs or whether it was starting an agency or whatever it may be, and I just went after those opportunities and didn't really think about an intermediary to tell me what to do. I just kind of so to me it was always clear. It wasn't. Yeah. It was sort of. I guess it was a subconscious thing. So for all those people who are at a job or trying to find a new job or whatever, yeah. what's the advice in saying, "Hey, fuck it, just." go start something or find your passion? Like, would you give someone advice who's really trying to figure out their path? Do they go get a job to learn a business? Right. Or do they just say, screw it, I'm gonna go do it, and if I fail along the way, I'll figure it out? Well, first of all, I mean, only certain type of people can start companies, and only, you, only in certain periods of your life are you able to start companies. If you have a lot of personal overhead or you have a lot of obligations, sometimes you just can't afford the risk of not having a paycheck. You know, so I think that's somebody needs to ask themselves, do I can I really absorb the risk? Because any business has a dip, and the dip is a period of time that you need to work hard to get through. You know, your business will start like this, and you'll have a dip. And the deeper the dip, usually the bigger the upside on the other side. And if you can't afford to, to take the time to get out of the dip, it's not going to go anywhere a year later anyway. So you need, really need to look yourself in the mirror and say, am I ready to do that? Secondly, you need to just have a lot of discipline. I mean, the thing that annoys me the most when people say, oh, you don't have a boss, that's not true. My bosses my, are my clients. Uh, no matter who you are, if you have your own business or you're working for somebody, there's always somebody else signing your check, right? And, so, and even if you have a consumer business, your users are your boss. So you always right. need to report to somebody. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and so I think that's a big myth. Um, another big myth is that a lot of people, when, when you think about running your own business, Ultimately, the only difference between running your own business and working for somebody, um, it, it, financially speaking, is the equity you build. And if you look yourself in the mirror and say, if I don't think my equity in my business is going to be worth X amount more in two to three years, well, then you might as well just go work for somebody because you don't right. have the risk, you don't have the frustration. And you're sharing your paycheck. Isn't right. It? Yeah. You need to create value, business value, That's if something. you're going to start a business, not just to feel like you don't have a boss because, again, ultimately, you do. So unless you're not, unless you're, you know, if you're trying to build something of equity with real equity value, yes, and you think you can, and there's a roadmap to doing so, well, then it's great to be an entrepreneur. But those are all considerations that people need to consciously think about. I never thought about any of those things. <laughs> I kind of just went. Well, yeah, but, well, you, you were you were, were you were aggressive event. enough and young enough that it almost you didn't have that big risk. Thought you process. didn't have yeah yeah, and it was right. like. Most people had a college. Well, there was a risk when I started Mr. Youth because, uh, you know, I, I, I did have some overhead and I did have other job offers. And I basically was working at a company that was about to be acquired and I, and I had great relationships and I made the conscious decision to, to go for it. So there was some risk, but, um, you know, not as much as somebody that, might, that has a family and it's, you know, in their late 30s or whatever, maybe in a mortgage. That's a lot of risk. Um, did having good partners and support network play into that? Um, did you have, you know, a really good, you know, built a good system of, hey, I know I can call on these people. I know I, yeah. I have relationships that yeah. I can call on. So it's less scary because I've built, you know, that network that I can navigate through. Was that, did that play into it? I think partners are very hard because 
it's that if you're a really motivated driven entrepreneur, it's really hard to believe that somebody else is going to have that same passion as you. Right. And a lot of people go into new business ventures and liberally just bring in partners. But every partner you bring, you're you're you know proportionally diluting what your future upside is in that equity, which is the only reason to start a business in the first place. If you have bring in a 50-50 partner, all of a sudden your your opportunity is half of what it was, and unless right. the one plus one equals three, which sometimes happens, but mm-hmm. a lot of times just doesn't. I think bringing on partners, especially when you're first starting a business, often does, especially 50-50 partners. Over time, as you build your business, you can bring in special specialism in right. certain areas, whether it's product design or a CFO or somebody who's great at new business, that can fill gaps that you've identified after you started the business. And after you started, started it, you usually don't need to give up 50%. Right. And I think from a partner perspective, I think a lot of times people bring in partners because deep down inside, they're really insecure mm. As we all are in some ways. Comfort like, that exactly. someone else is there. Like maybe too. I really can't do right. this on their own. But that's overrated. You can get advisors to do that at, at the beginning. So I mm. think that's just for a much a, lesser piece of equity instead of giving less. up. Right. Yeah. But a lot of times like you have a friend that you like and you have a good time with and somewhat motivates you. Like, let's start it together. Same goes for raising money too early. Yep. Yep. Same goes for raising money too early. You really need to think about that. Um, long and hard. In a service business, you should never need to raise money. Mm. So when I started Miss Youth, we didn't raise a dollar. Because your client should should provide enough free cash flow right. for you to actually start a business. If you're actually if you're creating a product, that's that's raise different. Money. But some people try to raise money for a service business, which I never really get. Which if you can't sell the service, you shouldn't be in business anyway. Right, <laughs> right, exactly. And they're usually not upfront capital demands on the, on a service business. I started with a laptop in my apartment and a phone, and that's really all you need. And you right. Need to be able to close, sell people on you. Deals, yeah. A service business, you can sell people on yourself. And that is a great, a service business is a great way to get a business um, to a certain, uh, to a certain point altitude mm-hmm. because you can sell yourself. That has scalability issues, obviously. Right. A product business has way more upside, but there's way more risk because you're building a product that you're putting out there and you're hoping that somebody's going to like it or not, but you really don't have the control. Where if I walk into a meeting, I know what I'm going to say. So I, can, I know I can control myself as a product. And that, that, that's the difference between a, you know, a service and product manager. But on the product side, you have a bigger potential upside because you're building more equity because it's more unique or it's, it's more tangible. It's more scalable. More scalable. The product's more scalable. I can create a product and have a million people use it. I can't meet with a million people tomorrow. Right. So you can create something that's massive overnight, Instagram, so to speak. You know, Instagram had a, probably a 0.01% chance of success, mm. but it nailed it. A service business probably has a... Uh, 50% plus percent chance of success, especially if you're a, a, a really um, charismatic figure because you can get people to believe and buy into you. And mm-hmm. as long as you can deliver what you're offering, your service business should be able to get off the ground. And then on that note, you can attract top talent to support the service. Correct, correct. Because you need, you can't, but, again, but that, you can't. But that's, when person. you look at gaps in building your business and just, just places where a lot of companies fall off, you know, you have the point where it's like you and your very close network that you talk to every day in terms of like five employees. Right. You, you can bring those people on, you can ke- keep your hands in everything, and you can build a service business, say, that gets to two to three million dollars in revenue. Right. Then you have to get to a point where you need to bring in other partners because you need to scale yourself. So that's one place where a lot of people fall down. But then after that, then you need to scale the business and go from five employees to 25 employees. And then you need to know how to manage and have an organizational design that can actually work. And that's another place where a lot of businesses kind of fall off. So there's, there's different crossroads in building a business where you can make the wrong decision. And every one is critical um, in, in getting to the next step. Is part of that scale and bringing partners in at the right time? So, so the people that are managing different subgroups care as much as you care? You need people to care. And, so, and, so that's like you need them to be And there's invested. two ways to get people to care. One way is you give them an equity stake, but again, you really right. can't be too liberal. The other way is to really get them to believe in you and your vision, and not out of fear, but out of inspiration. Mm-hmm. And you need to be a charismatic leader, and you've got to get people to buy into your journey. Mm-hmm. And that's what's going to make them stay late at night. That's what's going to make them answer that cell phone call when they're at dinner for a client. You, you need to... And they're not going to do it if they don't believe in you. And that's why so many companies don't perform well because people just don't care about the job. It's just a paycheck to them. Um, you need people working for you that are thinking about their job when they're in the shower, right? And, and, and when, the, when, when, when their mind can wander anywhere, but it's wandering to work. And you're only going to do that if people really want to succeed for you. You know, I've had employees that they feel so bad when things go wrong 
because they feel like they disappointed me. Mm. And, 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 and they don't want to disappoint me because they believe in me and I believe in them. And, and that is something you really can't put a price on. And those people, first of all, I would do anything for today, to this day, even though a lot of them don't work for the company anymore. Right. Um, but secondly, you can't buy, it's not money with those people. A lot of people, just they take pride in what they do. And I've been very fortunate to have so many people over the last 10 years walk in and out of his office that have been that way. So a big part of managing a large team as you scale is not necessarily about micromanaging. It's about building an overall culture yeah. that drives everyone to individually yeah. care. Without that culture from the top down, yeah. you're never going to be able to manage a team of 100, 200. Yeah. How many people do you have here now? In the, Globally. In the, in the organization, Hundreds. we have about 500. Wow. Yeah. So. And it all started 10 years ago with you saying, I want to build a yeah. non-traditional media Targeting company. Target shooters. Yeah. Targeting media. Yeah. The other point, I think an important point, is the whole notion of proactivity. Mm -hmm. So when you're hiring somebody, you know, I, I believe in this world that you should never ask somebody for something before you've done something for them. So for me, people who want to work here and they ask me for a job or they ask me to get their friend an interview, to me, the people who I'm looking at, I want to know what they've done and are they proactive. And the best way for them to prove that is to do something for me which, which is, as a CEO of a business, is give me ideas. What do you think about the company? What do you think about its website? What do you think about its work? Tell me it sucks if you think it sucks. But do something. Right. Spend time to actually proactively do something. If somebody wants a job somewhere, they should, they should have things, a list of things that they've actually done. I created this blog. I, 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 I made this video. I, I wrote this thesis. That, and because if people have done things, it means that they're proactive. And how that translates to business is there's no way you can build a business if everyone that works for you is just sitting around waiting to be told what to do. Right. Um, because you, you just can't think of everything. You need people that are going to proactively come up with initiatives on their own and just go out and do it. And you as a manager need to be okay with relinquishing control and allowing them to do it. And I've had people that work for me that come up with these projects and they run off on their own, one of which resulted in a software company that we spun up on mm -hmm. Right. that you know fairly well. Yeah. So, um, so I think that you hire people like that, that, that have the initiative, that like want to go out and create other projects, your business is going to expand in ways you've never imagined because it's on the backs of other people's productivity. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I think that's good. Cool. A lot of good stuff. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. You got it, man. Until next time. <laughs>